Hi, it's Dr. Noel Williams, Optimal Health Associates, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. Uh, COVID update. I'm going to do the depression summary by, by probably tomorrow, but I had too many requests to do long haul COVID type stuff today. So I'm going to do more of that. So again, COVID, the numbers are coming down. Uh, for those of you who have read about COVID in the last couple months and have concerns about Delta. Uh, the vast majority of cases since July in the United States have been Delta and at least in Oklahoma also. And then by August, they pretty much have been nearly 90, between 95 and 100 percent. So if people are getting infected and we've had uh, several people, again, we have a couple people every day get infected. Um, it's Delta. It's Delta. We uh, so, you know, and we get the people through it. Let's talk about the CDC before I talk about long haul. Rachel Walensky, who I believe is actually becoming negligent, um, has said that they're going to potentially redefine fully vaccinated in the coming weeks or months, or they may, uh, differently in that you have to be get a booster to be considered fully vaccinated. And again, with sh no data, no data. One, la one study, not lousy, but one study that... Um, from Israel showing a little bit of benefit. But again, if you're gonna use that study, you gotta use the other studies from the same basic parameters from Israel, the same, I mean, the federal government in Israel and the health services there that showed that there was a 2,700 reduction in um, infection and in prior infected versus vaccinated. So you can't pick, oh, I'm gonna use this data from this source, but not use that data from this source. You either gotta believe all of it or none of it to an extent. I mean, it's not always that way, but it's pretty much the trend. And again, it's the selective picking and choosing. So again, if 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 uh, fully vaccinated, which is gonna be some new standard, and they're gonna put on the star of David on us if we don't get the booster, um, I would encourage everyone to call your senator and congressman or congresswoman and complain. This is, there's no science backing this. Again, I'm very for vaccination uh, for adults and at-risk people. I'm very, very, very uh, against mandating vaccines. I've really kind of got to the point with this mandating. People have the right to refuse. And, and you can think they're, they're not as smart as you, but, eh, or whatever, and I don't, I'm not quibbling over any of that. It's just people have the right to refuse to get vaccinated. They do. You do not have the right to tell someone to get vaccinated. You don't, ever. Because these vaccines are experimental. It, the FDA thing is a meaningless label. They don't have any of the data long-term. Again, I was happy to get one. Kim was happy to get one, or we, I don't know, we were happy to get one. We felt they were necessary. We were happy for, I felt they were necessary for our children, but that's a personal judgment I made as someone who reads a lot. Not everyone agrees with the same interpretation of the data. It doesn't make them dumb. It means they have a brain that works differently in terms of interpreting stuff. And I definitely think restricting jobs and all of this really is particularly stupid because it's only hurting our entire economy and people's livelihoods, which is really what it's about because that's what it's about. It's not about taking care of people because we already know that more than 40% of, or we I don't know a substantial number of people who've been prior vaccinated are gonna get infected with Delta and probably other variants. And the goal is never gonna be to keep on vaccinating people because it's gonna cause problems. And it's gonna be just like the flu vaccine in the end, a gigantic waste of time. And those of you who think, oh God, we gotta get a flu vaccine because you've called Walgreens, um, because I have to call Wal Walgreens and CVS to call in scripts all the time and I have to listen to this freaking crap about, oh, you gotta get your flu vaccine because you're at risk. You know, how about what's the risk? Oh, you're gonna save best data, one case in 700. Oh, come on, <laughs> it's totally useless. But okay, so let's talk about long haul COVID. Long haul COVID is, and a big shout out to my friend, Dr. Carl Roskowski, sent me a very funny text. Um, thank you uh, about something about people. Again, someone prattling on and on about wearing masks on TV in public and then not doing so when they're in public. Oh, okay. Um, but Big shout out to Dr. Ryskowski and all the doctors everywhere working hard, all the nurses. Be nice to them. We, at our office, we had a, I can't say who because it was a patient brought in us a very nice thing of cookies as a thank you for all we do. Um, totally unnecessary, but very much appreciated today since we did have someone who was pretty much psychotically postal. And um, anyway, 
for no for no good reason. And um, but that's my opinion professionally. Uh, but we still apologized and said we were sorry. But you know, yelling at the staff, like I always say, doesn't work for us. Um, yelling at me is fine. Don't yell at the staff. Um, so thank you to the person who brought in the cookies for the entire staff today, just as a thank you and showing appreciation. Um, but long haul COVID. So there are a lot of issues with long haul COVID or post vaccine side effects. Uh, and it's again, just think inflammation and you get inflammation and interleukins and prostaglandins and all the sicky stuff and histamines. And a lot of that stuff first crosses your blood brain barrier. So people get emotional symptoms or cognitive symptoms. And that's why I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do a review of depression because depression is going up, one, because of COVID, just in general, because everything we've bon gone through and anxiety, but then COVID induces depression and anxiety and can induce psychosis if you have just the wrong set of circumstances. And it's because inflammation crosses your blood brain barrier. You're gonna catabolize your serotonin and probably some of your norepinephrine. That's gonna then cause an imbalance in your neurotransmitters, so you start to feel bad. And it's mother nature's way. Why do inflammatory mediators, if you uh, break your leg, cross your blood brain barrier? Probably mother nature wants you to, to squirrel. They want, it wants you to rest and recover. And so don't think of it as weird. Think of it as, no, mother nature wants you to recover, and so it makes you feel bad, so you can't do anything. But unfortunately, it makes people feel bad emotionally. So anxiety and depression, uh, cognitive dysfunction. And since you're getting inflammatory mediators in your uh, central nervous system, you get neuropathies and you can get all kinds of weird neuropathies from pins and needles, um, bladder urgency frequency, which is sometimes can be local, but some kind, sometimes can be central nervous system. You can get weird, weird, weird neuropathies, pins and needles in every part of your body. Um, up and down your spine, limbs, uh, reproductive track, everywhere. Um, so there's there's things we can do about that. There, so but that's one section. So central nervous system, GI. Uh, people have with COVID a lot of uh, upset stomach, diarrhea, gastritis, and then subsequently can have some colitis and inflammation from it that's very routine. I'm not belittling it, but it's just, that's normal stuff. You can get prostatitis, you can get thyroiditis, you can get uh, cystitis of your bladder. Um, any basic organ system can get inflamed and get icky um, for, uh, so subsequently to COVID. And the thing is, it doesn't always occur, you can have mild COVID and then it hits two to four weeks later from the initial infection because of the kind of buildup of inflammation. And the thought process on a lot of this has to do with um, endotheliosis, which is when the lining of, of organs or tissues that are hollow or, or like your lungs or your blood vessels or there's a surface internally uh, gets inflamed in the, in the lungs. It has to do loss of the glycocalyx, which is the sugar coating that keeps everything smooth, which leads to heart attack and arterial stroke. Um, so think your vascular system. So basically the whole body inflames and you can have any imaginable symptom from COVID. It's beautiful that this is such a nasty virus, which we all can con continue to lie to ourselves that it wasn't man-made, but whatever. <laughs> have to always get in those shots. Kim's not listening, it's okay. No, I'm listening. So, but anyway, so think global inflammation and global inflammation leads to fatigue. So how do you fix it? Because your cells are worn out, you're worn out and you feel bad. Well, you know, there's some interesting stuff out there that that we approach regeneratively for this. Um, and it, so people ask, who do you go to? Well, you gotta go to someone who, one, doesn't mind taking care of stuff that's hard, that they're gonna have to see a few times to figure it out, and then go through some steps to treat you. So it's, it's not like, oh, you broke your arm and you put a cast on it and you see the doctor and you take it off in six weeks. You may have to be seen a few times, people have to think. And that isn't like a strong point of medicine now because everybody's like that. And God forbid you have multiple COVID symptoms because a lot of times your doctor will say, stop, you only get one complaint today. Well, they may all be from COVID, but you only get one complaint, that's a problem too. So you have to find someone who's a little more detail oriented. And I sometimes inadvertently say doctor, but I also mean providers, nurse practitioners, PAs, they're fully capable of taking care of this. But the, the key steps is they need to be detail oriented, be willing to listen and be able to see a unified pathophysiologic process, meaning it's inflammation hitting different spots and you have to address it. So things you always think about for these people are fish oil, nutritional 
type stuff for regeneration. Um, there's something, ozonation therapy for regenerating uh, mitochondrial function in cells um, that can have the potential to restore energy, re restore function, functionality in different ways for people. Um, we can do, uh, there's interesting other stuff with some, I always have to be careful how to put this, because uh, I don't want to break any FDA guidelines. So just simple to say there are other things that you can do that are a little more cutting edge for stuff, depending on your situation for people, that is anti-inflammatory and restorative. But the baseline is vitamins, vitamins, nutrition, fish oil, seaweed extracts, but you gotta just go to see someone who has an interest in it and understands how you break inflammatory pathways. So people who are very focused on that, whether it, it's, an, it's an MDDO, naturopath, um, acupuncturist, those types of people who don't mind hard to treat things was who you go see. I know that's not very specific, but that's kind of the bottom line. I mean, you have to find a practice if you're in Texas or you're in Missouri or you're in wherever, California, that find someone who's taking care of COVID people. And because if they've taken care of COVID people when they were sick in the first and the front end, they're gonna be they're gonna be taking care of them on the back end. Same thing with um, people who've had challenges with the vaccine. And again, the challenges with the vaccine have to do with inflammation and immune responses sometimes being too vigorous and that can cause problems for people. And again, it, you risk balance when you're a person. I mean, if you're you know, super, super healthy and taking all your vitamins and thin and um, have a whole bunch of qualities that you think make you less, then you get less benefit from the the vaccine and you don't want to take those risks, you know, that that's okay. You just have to have a plan for if you get COVID and what you're going to do about it. And that's going to get a lot easier in hopefully four weeks or less. I'm hoping where when the FDA should approve or give an emergency use authorization for um, the Merck drug, there's going to be some other studies available um, depending where you are regionally on a few other things for outpatient therapy that are going to be coming soon for people with COVID. So I think, again, things will change with the FDA getting on board finally after two years with some outpatient therapies besides that are easy to do versus um, just the only one we've had is antibodies, which is great, but they haven't always been available and there's a strict criteria set and not everyone can get them. So that will all be positive. So Kim, any questions or miss anything? Like you didn't have time to look. So anyway, that's just mostly what I wanted to talk about today. So. Uh, nothing real exciting. It's just where, you know, this is about medicine and, and the, the medicine's about details and driving and getting into the nitty gritty and just sticking with someone until you get them better. And you can do it with long haul and all the COVID stuff. Uh, so tomorrow, the, or the next one I'm going to do in the next few days will be on depression. All right. Good night. <laughs>